Theater in all of California. That's right, here in Monterey. And the oldest picture is this one. At least that's what we are told. But upon closer examination, what I see is a pole, a pole, an empty looking pole. You see that? Why is it relevant? Well, I don't know, but it's cut off right here. See that? So why? Why is it cut off right here? Why the vanilla sky treatment right here? I shall direct your attention now to exhibit B. The same very pole, but this time an electric top. What gives? Why? Why would they whitewash out the pole? There it is again. Shazam. So, uh, I don't get it. Why you take the top of the pole off? What are you hiding? I mean, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you not want us to see, dude? It's kind of suspicious. And then, of course, we really hit the skids. This, uh, maybe it has to do with the pure drugs you were purveying out of the, the side shed here. A little side hustle, shucking your, your side corn or whatever. And you'd never know it, would you? Just like the politicians of today. Today, it can clean up rather nicely, and you'd never know about the seedy underbelly it once contained. Now it's a museum, and rather nice looking. It can come back. It can always come back. Now this here is the Alameda City Hall. Now the city of Alameda is interesting because it is the first city in California, and the second in the United States to operate its own power plant. And you know, California being one of the later states, 1845 or 1850 becoming a state, and yet it leads the way in so many things it is kind of baffling. So, this city hall had the benefit of incandescent lighting, a significant luxury at the time, of course. The first, I mean, second power plant in the country. It's almost as if maybe it was already there. I don't know, but look at that. Oh, the lightning rod, right, right, right. Because you needed a glass globe to shatter in order to know that your building had been hit by lightning. Not bloody likely. But whatever, that's the story we're told, so. This is monumentally conceived, of course, by the George Percy, the design reflecting the current fashion for the Romanesque revival. You remember that, when all the cowboys were obsessed with the Romanesque revival and uh the henry hobson richardson character who we've read about in past novels he uh you know he was the inspiration behind this this beauty george wright was the surveyor and the architect percy and hamilton won the contest to design this which was preceded by a festive parade there's barely a thousand people to live there but still it is necessary to build this the entire basement is constructed of concrete a basement huh that's curious and there of course is a tower which accommodated a large large clock, which was postponed for lack of funds. You could build the building, but you couldn't have the clock. The tower was badly damaged because of the earthquake, you know. And the cupola was removed. In 1937, Carl Werner, architect for the Alameda High School, drew up plans for the removal of the tower, which resulted in the building in its present appearance. It's interesting that it got damaged in the 1906 earthquake, so it took them 31 years to remove it. Nothing uh, suspicious there. It all seems to check out perfectly. And yes, of course, all these things were affordable, but not the clock. And here, 50 years later, still no clock, just tower. You can afford all this. Balconies and balustrades and all this, but no clocks. Hmm. Not bloody. Light, light, light. Now this here is the Berkeley City Hall. We passed it by once before, but I came back with some interesting details. First of all, you have the architects John Bakewell and Brown graduated from the University of California in the 1890s, and they went to Paris to attend the École des Beaux-Arts, which, like every good fake architect, this is one of their first commissions. And they went on to design the San Francisco City Hall and Santa Fe Railroad Station in San Diego, because, you know, they're all similar, the Pasadena City Hall, and so on and so forth. They built it in the style of the French Renaissance, took up the entire block, two stories high with an attic and a basement. Basement, of course. Which, you know what I'm saying? What I'm saying. They say it's relatively untouched, including this stairwell of granite. There, so that's what's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting that it's untouched. No, 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 no. It had a competition, like all of them. Who, who was going to win? And, of course, Bakewell and Brown, which they got it 
The idea from the Town Hall in Tours, France, designed by Arthur Brown's teacher, M. Mr. M. Lalu. The city's new image was the Athens of the West, and all the large classic buildings rising, rising there. And of course, the city didn't want to be left behind the university. The cornerstone ceremonies was held in 1908 when the building was already under construction. A white granite cornerstone, they also had put a copper box with it, containing documents, mementos, and it claims with appropriate pomp in Masonic ceremonies. Interesting. I wonder what sort of Masonic ceremonies they're doing here. <laughs> that sounds very innocent. Some of these offices have later on moved to the uh, farm credit building because, you know, they all are just operating operating under the same umbrella, same owners, the insurance companies, the banks, and the government. It's all interchangeable. And here's what she looks like today. Looking very plausible that something like this could be built in these early times. The climactic event of this building is, of course, the 60-foot lantern and spire. The lantern rises from the roof with a paneled base terminating in a high metal balustrade around an open colonnade, supporting a classic entablature crowned by a narrow dome with engaged piers capped with finials. Atop the dome is a beveled spire on a base of graduated mold Buildings, which is exactly how I was going to describe this. It's like we were um, thinking the same things, you know, me and uh, the author here. See, clearly, these are graduated moldings. And clearly, those are finials on top of those engaged piers. Ugh, classic entablature crown, of course. Yep, this all looks very, very um, boring and mundane, really. But you have to wonder, what what was here? What was here in this trap door? What was here in this trapped door? That one, that one right there. <clears throat> we can move on. Move on, then. I've already moved on. You can't, you can't move on me. I've already moved on. Dude, I moved on way before moving on was cool. No. Well, well you're well on your way to making one of the worst videos of all time. Ouch. You don't need to be so rough. This is the Crow Creek Bridge. Significant in the area of engineering at the local level. The only known barrel arch open spandrel bridge in Alameda County. Isn't that fascinating? Well, <clears throat> allow me to explain. You see, well, it's difficult to tell from the surface here. Underneath, if you take a gander, what you can see are what's considered to be spandrels. Now, this here is a reinforced concrete bridge, and what this here is, is an open spandrel, and with a barrel arch. So this type of bridge and building began in 1889 in San Francisco, that's where it started. And then these concrete arch bridges follow. Usually these are filled, okay, which is called a filled spandrel bridge. This gave way to open spandrel bridges, like a see right here. Now, these walls here are usually filled with gravel or other earth, and this here is sort of a transitional design between the two. You could tell these solid concrete railings, where most open spandrels have them, them railings with the baluster types. You also have full width barrel arch here, meaning these here are not columns. They run all the way through the width of the bridge, okay? Now, that's enough about bridges, because that's probably very boring. But I'm just saying, without that bridge, you couldn't play poo sticks. So, <laughs> you you make up your mind. You do it. Without poo sticks, bro, be my guest. Wow. And just look at that baby. Look at that wonder. A real wonder to behold. That is the great City Hall of Oakland. That's right. Now, I know what you're thinking. A building like this has got to just have, look at these eagles. I am. Or phoenixes. Sorry. <clears throat> Phoenix. I just know that you're curious. And man, they must have just have just oodles of information. Tens of documents about this bad boy. Right? Wrong. One page. One page for this. Baffling. Baffling, I say. Architects Palmer and Hornbostel <laughs> won this and a prize in a contest, of course. Yes, yes, it's faced in granite. Yes, yes. It's got the cupola, balustrades, eagles, and capitals that you'd expect, and multifunctional city hall. And that's it. That's all you get. Ignore the disco ball. Ignore the grand parties that they probably have in this ballroom here. Ignore the fact that the mayor lives like a fucking king. Ignore it. Moving on! Lake Hume. Damn, I think. Hell, I don't remember. <laughs> Hold on, let me see if I can jar my memory. I'm super wrong! It's the Hume Lake Dam. The Hume Bennett Lumber Company also known as the U.S. Forest Service. I didn't know they owned lumber companies. Then again, I don't know anything. Hume Lake Dam is the world's first reinforced concrete multiple arch dam. Now, the write-up about this, it's basically an autobiography about a man named John S. Eastwood. You have this combination of John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. I mean, out here in the West at this time, but... You know, that's gotta be a coincidence. To be fair, there's lots of Eastwoods and Johns. Although only one John S. Eastwood that I could find that was born in that year, and he was from Canada. And not this guy, but either way. It's important because of the, the um, lumber industry. More importantly, the redwood lumber industry. So, really played a part in a, uh, some dirty material. Now it's basically recreational. But after the completion of this dam, other engineers, of course, emulated Mr. Eastwood's work. 
And by 1930, over 50 of these dams types were used all throughout the world. Now, Mr. Eastwood... This story starts with the history of the redwood logging industry. And among the most remarkable features of the southern Sierra Nevada mountains were the he are the huge giant sequoia redwood trees. Largest living organisms on Earth, allegedly, at one time, they covered extensive areas at altitudes between 5,000 and 7,000 feet. In the 1860s and 70s, many of the groves east of Fresno and between Kings River and Coahuila River, river large mecha mechanized logging operations developed, and there were two jackasses named Smith and Moore and their corporate descendants. They made a flume that would transfer transport timber from its sawmill to the lumberyard near the Southern Pacific tracks in the town of Sanger, 60 miles away, and basically it opened the way for massive exploitation of the huge redwood grove in the Converse Basin. It cut down thousands of giant sequoia, and their wasteful techniques, they actually uh, went bankrupt. So this was became known as the Sanger Lumber Company, and they collapsed financially. A man named Thomas Hume from Michigan was like, actively expanding its timber holdings throughout the states. And another guy named Ira Bennett you know, tells him about this demise of this company, and they formed the Hume Bennett Lumber Company with the intent of recommencing large-scale lumbering activities in the region. But they realized that the area had already been logged so extensively that in order to turn a profit, they had to extend much deeper. So they abandoned the first sawmill, and they made a new one higher up in the mountains, allegedly. Going upstream, they start working on this, and they hire this guy, John Eastwood, in 1907. Mr. Eastwood was born in Minnesota in 1857. At the ripe age of 23, he left the Midwest to work on railroad construction projects. And from that time on, his professional life focused on the Pacific Coast region. At the ripe age of 26, he left the Pacific Northwest and headed for California's Central Valley. During his three years of railroad work, he somehow developed construction and surveying skills, and he considered himself qualified to set up his own office as a surveyor civil engineer. And at the time, Fresno was a railroad town, so... <laughs> Possessing practical engineering skills of his own, he opened a downtown office. And a few years later, at the ripe age of 28-ish, he became Fresno's first city engineer. But soon decided he didn't like the relatively sedentary life of a bureaucratic engineer, you know, in a town that had basically no bureaucracy, and began directing his energy towards projects that extended far beyond municipal concerns. Again, with no experience, he leads a surveying team that laid out the route of this 60-mile aforementioned lumber flume. So then he becomes involved with hydraulic engineering. He worked on irrigation projects. He worked on hydroelectric power. Oh. At this time, there was America's first alternating current power system in Redlands, California. In Redlands, California. More than any of these developed places on the East Coast that were told they'd been here hundreds of years. In Redlands, California. Okay. And this guy apparently played a major role in all this because of his pioneering work in hydroelectric design, from which nothing is mentioned so far. So this power supply company, this plant, needed a water source that was abundant, and they actually went bankrupt because of a long drought in 1899. So therefore, Mr. Eastwood appreciated the critical importance of constructing storage dams. Here he is, appreciating storage dams. Then he becomes involved with Huntington's Pacific Light and Power Company in designing a huge hydroelectric system on the main fork of the San Joaquin River, known today as Southern California Edison Company's Big Creek Project. Somehow, he was removed from the project, dismissed as the chief engineer, so he began looking for a new place for a new dam project to work on. And behold, here he found one. The Hume Lake Dam. Of course, after completing this one, he went on to build 16 more in California, Arizona, Idaho, Utah, and British Columbia, and then died. He did dams that held back debris for mining companies, dams that stored water for irrigation districts, and dams to impound water for municipal uses. Flood control. He never again built a dam for a logging company or any more dams in the Fresno region. Designed dams for clients throughout the rest of California and the mountainous west. So I don't know, did this person even exist? Guy who designed a dams and then got removed, he's not even in the history books, which this admits here openly, here in the footnotes. And here's also a interesting little footnote. Down here at the very, very end, it says here that he was paid for his work a rather interesting sum of money. 1000 $766.67, which if I add those up, see here, plus one, plus six, plus six, plus six, that's weird, plus seven. Oh, wowie. Pure coincidence, I'm certain. Just a, <laughs> a random, a random coincidence, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So I don't know about you, Mr. 
Eastwood. I don't think you really existed, personally. Just someone that they could say designed all this crap. It was already there. For for all the uh, hundreds of years of colonies in, uh, on the East Coast, suddenly to people just land here in the 50s and within 20 years develop power plants and hydroelectric dams and all these things that are the first of their kind in, uh, in all the world, I just find that to be highly unlikely. This is the Van Dusen River Bridge. As you can tell, we've got the open spandrels we talked about earlier. Mr. John B. Leonard was a leading proponent and early designer of these concrete bridges. There's only three of these known to be designed by him. That's why he's he's so well known that there are three bridges known to be designed by him. That's right. Constructed in 1920, this guy, 1888, of course, moved to L.A., came to San Francisco at the ripe age of 25, and spent the rest of his life in the Bay Area. Employed by the American Bridge Company the next 10 years, specializing in concrete and artificial stone. Chief engineer for Healy Tibbets, builder of wharves, bridges, and railroads. Just like everybody showed up in San Francisco in 1888, immediately became an expert in everything. Oh, I forgot to mention at one point that guy, John Eastwood, he started a architecture publication magazine, and then he ran off to Carmel with the subscription money. What is that? Is that uh, what can be more of a fraud than that? <laughs> running off to Carmel. Great escape plan. Obviously, everyone knew where you went because it's in the history books. Or it's just completely made up because, I mean, I don't think you can just steal money and run away with it. Like, ah, ha, ha, that guy got you all. He's in Carmel now. And no, no one did anything about it. Just, I mean, whatever, dude. This here is the Honeydew Creek Bridge. South of the town of Honeydew in Humboldt County. Yes, sir. It was built in 1925 for vehicular traffic. The only known war and trust bridge in the state of California. Settlers infiltrated this area during the Union Oil Company boom of 1864-1866 in the Petrolia area. Town of Honeydew gets their names from an occurrence where early trappers camping along the creek noticed a heavy, sticky dew covering all the belongings when they would wake up in the morning. It was so sweet it could be used to sweeten their coffee and earned the name Honeydew. It was actually the exude of cottonwood leaves. So the region became known as the Honeydew area. It's a bunch of cottonwood trees jerking off all you guys all night long. You wake up and you sweeten your coffee with it. That's disgusting. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> the very idea. This bridge, by the way, was destroyed during the landslide, okay? In 1921, which makes no sense because they just said it was built in 1925. So, <laughs> what the hell is that? Let me make sure I look at that right. Yes, yes. 1925 was the destruction date. 1922, bridge destroyed by landslide. Oh, so then what the hell is that bridge? How could it be destroyed before it was built? This is so confusing. Yep, in 1925, they rebuilt it, I guess. I mean, obviously, but Frank Kelly, they rebuilt it. The bridge is in a deteriorated condition at the time of this writing. It's been damaged by large logging trucks. The concrete abutments are cracked. The truss end posts show evidence of numerous collisions. The old Honeydew Creek Bridge shall never again be part of the road system. Decayed and decrepit. And I see their point. Not exactly a bridge I would trust with my life. Ooh. Now you can see Mr. Eastwood's work up close and personal. Yes, sir. Mr. Eastwood with no prior experience. He just knew this would work. He just knew it. What a genius. Yeah. Yep, look at him. We did it. We did it. These guys pointing to the sky. Look up there, it's burning. And ladies and gentlemen, for my next act, if you'll, uh, there's a dolphin about to jump out of this creek and snatch his hat off. I don't know. And who are you? I'll do it. I'll fucking jump, dude. Do what I dare you. Very, very interesting work here. I don't, I don't know what to think of any of this. It's definitely a monumental piece of engineering. I don't know why they have to fluff it up with such strange backstory. And why they had to just ruin this entire river so they could cut down more trees. Such is life, I suppose, in this modern era. These looking ancient ancient as if they've just had some new wheels put on them. I just don't understand what I'm seeing. Concrete, and then you made some of this with stone? You, you blasted through this hard rock? It seems like they just used pre-existing. I'm not saying that they didn't have anything to do with it, but why would you go from this to this? I mean, you would you would show consistency in your material. This leads to the idea that half of this stuff, the infrastructure was here, and they just they built off it, took ideas from it. Hey, more credit to them. I don't know why they didn't just straight say that. Yeah, we saw this thing that was uh, constructed, and so we uh, made it better. Doesn't make sense. There's just something fucky about it. Like, what is this with crappy-ass photography? You got pictures like this, and then it's like, buh. You got pictures in the Civil War that are crystal clear, and yet we're going to come out here and do this. 60, 70 years later, take pictures like this. Buh. These are trash. Little Rock Dam. Now, this is Little Rock Dam. Mr. Hobart Bosworth assisted with the uh, construction of this, doc this document, designed by... Our boy, John Eastwood. The rebar alone for this dam was 526 tons, 25,000 yards of concrete, 
cubic yards. And the author goes out of his way to emphasize the upstream sloping of the arches, which basically, because the upstream face is sloped, the water stored, well, it, well, it creates a vertical force, which actually, the arches, they're designed, it's all designed so that water pressure can only compress. So it makes it much more safe, allegedly. First dam in the world built with such an angle. John Eastwood, though his name appears rarely in California history books, it goes on to tell, explain to the reader why engineers rarely share the historical spotlight. Oh, really? And admits that practically no one knows much about the man who designed it or the experiences in his engineering career that fostered his interest in designing a dam of such stature. He was born in Minnesota. He went to the University of Minnesota. He graduated in 1880 and went to work on a railroad. I don't know why all these documents insist on just giving uh, biographies about people. We get it. John Eastwood is the most amazing guy that ever lived. Okay, God. Now here we have the Los Angeles City Hall. Oh, much, much could be written about this city hall. And much is. I'm gone are the days where I felt like I could just fly through pictures and make fun of everything. First of all, it should be known that there are 27 types of marble found here. Contributions, decoration by Herman Sachs and Anthony Heinzenbergen. They began this in 1926. The three architects were from England. They won the contest, of course. It's like you could say the same thing about every building ever. It's neoclassic. It's in excellent condition. Only a brief description of the interior details is included. But they say things like this. They broke ground on it in 1926, and it was ready to go. Cornerstone laid. Building occupied. Less than two years later. It broke the Los Angeles strict building height limit of 150 feet. It is a 28-story building where the old limit was 12 with a 160-foot pyramid tower. Gladding McBean supplied 3,000 tons of enamel finished terracotta. The mortar used consisted of sand from every county in California, cement from each of the cement mills in the state, and water collected from each of the 21 missions, increasing the symbolism of the structure. How corny. President Coolidge himself pressed a telegraph key in his White House office to light the Lindbergh beacon at the apex of the structure. That as the grand finale. Oh my god, give me a break. There were visiting Disney dignitaries. A procession of Angelinos stretching three miles. A dedication line at the Biltmore, a movie production called Historical Pageantry. Ridiculous. The structure clearly draws its form from Bertram Goodhue, you know that name, from the Nebraska State Capitol, of course. Of course. Yes, yes. Uh, while well, the Tower of Nebraska State was capped with a dome, here we decided to go with the Stepped Pyramid. It was, uh, you know, intended to be a streamlined version of an ancient Greek monument. The tomb of the King of Mausolus at Halicarnassus. Of course. That's very L.A. That's very, the, the iconography, the imagery, and symbolism of L.A. That's, that's exactly what I would expect. And here they don't disappoint. It's highly complex. Here the architects presented the citizens with an architectural program that reads like a history book. It's supposed to remind people of the origins and its aspirations for the future. So he worked with philosopher Hartley B. Alexander to drop the ideological program of decoration for the library, Mr. Goodhue did. I see. Regular granite blocks and bronze and bronze doorways and spare no expense on this monument. They claim that they evoked architectural styles from numerous periods of history. Monastic tradition, the shallow saucer dome and stylized mosaics typically found in early Byzantine churches. The city council chambers in the form of a basilica, the earliest Christian church. How, oh, what a coincidence. And the public works session recalls Romanesque monastery spaces. Of course it does. Yes, yes, very elegant. LA right here. Man with the spear and all these scenes. The Irish work here. The endless knots. I get it. You home run, gentlemen. This screams LA. The barrel vaulted corridors derive their architecture from Renaissance forms. European architecture. And yeah, nothing says LA like Europe. You know what I'm saying? Inspired by Greek design with inscriptions over the portal that read, let us have faith that might makes right. Aha. Uh -huh. Basically, he who has gold makes the rules and righteousness exalteth a people from Solomon. So quotes from Abraham Lincoln and King Solomon. Two pretty much evil people cast as heroes. Bronze doors that depict six scenes from California's history. The finding and naming of the site of LA. The City of Angels, of course. The founding of the City of Angels. American occupation. There it is. Public school founding. Opening of the aqueduct head gate and placing the last stone at the breakwater. Henry Lyon took it upon himself to create these. And yes, of course, every city hall needs this. Just like we've seen all over California. All of this making sense. The zodiac signs here. The eight-pointed star here. The 
pagan gods here, the intricate ceiling here, all of this very necessary in your new city. The basement, by the way, is large enough to comprise of parking areas, mechanical rooms, equipment rooms, offices, and storage areas. Many of the corridors have original marble bases, doors, frames, and oak moldings, etc., etc. There are two banks of elevators. One goes to the 10th floor, the other 11th through 22nd floor. And what an absolutely ridiculous display of wealth, opulence, and impossible construction, along with unlikely allegorical figures, the cast bronze chandeliers, and the silhouetted figures that depict explorers and settlers, black marble bases, the beamed ceilings of the passengers in the rotunda, by the way, they are, of course, California Redwood, and Basically, this makes me just want to tell Los Angeles politicians, who, by the way, have one of the largest homeless populations in the realm. Fuck you. Sincerely, from all of America, thank you. Pardon my language. <laughs> and with all due respect. This here, oh, is a Goodyear Rubber Company. More than 74 acres this building is. Don't be fooled this little facade here. This bad boy is monstrous. Allegedly built in 1919, at least 13 buildings. And this place is so huge, it defies comprehension. So this was Goodyear's second plant. There was a serious water situation at the home plant in Akron. And they needed another one in the West Coast. Ample water supply, power, large labor force, taxation, favorable living conditions. And so they... It says here, an interesting tidbit, that they were not interested in building another factory, but in making a new branch a real California company, manned by California workers, promoted by California investments, and drawing from the West as much as possible. So I see. You didn't want to build a plant, huh? So what's the option? Find a pre-existing one. Well, they didn't want to build a plant, but then it says the next sentence, so they not only built a plant, <laughs> but also a textile mill. So they took over a park, broke ground in a cauliflower patch. There's something about breaking ground in a cauliflower patch to put a rubber plant in. This plant made 7,500 tires a day. Cotton plant that made 75,000 pounds of cord fabric weekly. The townsfolk complained. Too much land. Too much land. From the looks of this old brickwork. The building was already fucking there. Protect our good name. How about you don't bulldoze a rainforest? Apparently, the labor force from this place was so huge that they basically lifted the town's population from half a million to over one and a half million. So they, they claimed that they brought a million people here. As originally planned, the majority of workers in the California plant were, quote, Californians. How's that even possible? But Goodyear, of course, imported raw materials from rubber, cotton, soapstone, carbon black, petroleum from such areas as Sumatra, Arizona, Texas, Wyoming, Montana, and of course, California. LA became the second greatest rubber manufacturing center in the U.S., supplying 11 states, Alaska and Hawaii, with 15,000 tires daily. They built an airship dock where the hydrogen gas pony blimp was assembled. Interesting. An airship dock, huh? It started the very first American airship passenger line between L.A. and Catalina Island. Wow. I did not expect to run into this here. With the utilization of helium in blimps in the beginning of a helium fleet in 1929, this required the construction of a larger and more modern docking facility. In 1979, the Goodyear complex was closed. This plant looks like a cistern to me. This building, or building... All of this is just ridiculous. What an amazing undertaking. And of course, brick, brick everywhere. Just brick everywhere. Where did they get all the damn brick? And of course, you have your little basement down there. No, no, don't try to hide. I see you. Where'd you go? You, 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 you. I see you down there. We know what's going on. Those are windows. We know it. Try to hide it. And really, it's just incredible. It's incredible. The machinery is so old world. Goodyear Rubber Company is going to put these urns up top for decoration. Give me a fucking break, bra. See here, more work days. And then peace for some, hell for others. That's interesting what they mean by that. And incredible machinery left behind. Unfathomable to walk away from this. Submerged windows and all. What waste. What incredible waste. What was this first? I mean, no doubt they added extensive mod. They made extensive modifications to make this work. I mean, what? What does that lead to, Governor? It's funny. I don't see anything mentioned of a basement in any of these documents. I read all 39 pages and breakdown of every single building. You know, simple one-story building, simple two-story building. No mention of a basement in anywhere. Interesting. All 30 plus buildings. Although in the drawings and the photographs, they clearly indicate what we all know is true of anything built in this era. This is the uh, hangar for the blimp. The airship. Unbelievable. You're just trying to pretend the blimps never happened. Why? I think we know why, but man, what? You know. 
without the Hindenburg, I wonder if modern day people would even know what the hell a blimp is. They'd be like, you know, some science fiction Teddy Ruxpin shit. <laughs> Actually, they probably don't know who freaking Teddy Ruxpin is, which I guess it doesn't really matter. Here's Barker's Brothers building. Lots of brothers around these times. Bent Brothers, Dent Brothers, Barker Brothers. One of the oldest operating single family commercial enterprises in LA. Founded in 1890. This structure was the largest furniture store in America, occupied exclusively by Barker Brothers. They offered advisory sketches, furnishing schemes, floor plans, decorative da 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 da. Built by Curlin and Beelman. Yes, sir. Alexander Curlin, born in San Francisco in 1880, of course. But moved to LA when he was 33, formed a partnership with Claude Beelman in 1921. And they worked together for nine years and they built these amazing buildings without any prior experience. Mr. Bill Barker, founder of Barker Brothers, was born in Indiana in 1864. Trained as a naval cadet, resigned from the academy, and moved to California. At the age of 26, he organized the firm of Bailey and Barker. They still retail furniture throughout Southern California. However, this here building, they eventually lost control of it. This whole part of LA is just ridiculous. What is that? <laughs> like a bunch of little kids up here at the top, little stone children. This ridiculous mamba jamba is the title guarantee and trust building. Even in the 80s, this was largely vacant. There was a thrifty drugstore at ground level and a few up offices upstairs. <laughs> Designed by Donald Parkinson again. One of the better examples of the zigzag zig style in LA. A good example of how to combine gothic and modern forms successfully, I guess. As usual, everything in the lower levels is stripped of all anything great, and then the upper levels are just uh, brimming with impossibilities. We know all about Mr. Parkinson. It was built on the site of the old California club, erected at the cost of merely $1.2 million in 1930. A 14-story tower. Decorative cornices above the 11th story. Highly visible architectural features. I would agree. Wealth means power. Great slogan in the city of the homeless. No irony there. There are panels in the interior which show prehistoric scenes. Very interesting. Another phoenix, as you can see. And this is a very interesting part of town here. And I don't believe a word of these stories. No, oh, here, of course, is the uh, fire station number 28. Interesting and unusual design. Actually, not so much, because uh, buildings of this identical stature and design are found all over the country. That's right, in Ohio and in Indiana. But I digress. 1912, we're told, built this. Uh, John Kremple and Walter Erx. In 1880, of course, again, Mr. Kremple arrived, worked until his death in 1933. Of course, numbers just... There's only two numbers, guys. Only two numbers in the world. And we're going to use them on everything. Horse-drawn engines, we're told. And it's unworkable for a modern-day fire engine. But it is fireproof. It's three stories with a basement. Classical references. The foundation leaves something to be desired as far as its level surface. Same with this building back here. You see the bricked-up small windows down here. There's a small chimney. I don't know why that's relevant. Let's make fun of me, dude. He's freaking a small chimney. Ah, ha, ha. Small chimney <laughs> ever. It's not the size of the chimney. It's how you smoke it, shunny. This entire section of the City of Angels is impressive. It's incredible. It's just mind-blowing. Here's the old thrifty store there. Sense of wonder and awe when you look at these. And a sense of just, it's unreal. I don't know why we would digress from making stuff like this unless we never did in the first place. How is this in any budget ever? These things. Like, it's just, it's it's silly to think that we made them. It's silly to think that the people that were here first, they were primitive. They definitely were not. These bridges, they are not primitive. This is the Shafter Bridge. These names. Uh, Mr. Oglesby. John Oglesby is the builder. So the startling growth after the end of the Civil War created a demand for redwood lumber. Why? Logging around the Russian River was active, to say the least. James McMillan Shafter, he had other interests. Born in Vermont in 1816. No, oh, you thought this was about bridges and buildings. Nope, nope, no, it's about dudes. Born in Vermont. On May 27th, he graduated from Lesley College. 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 L
cabins out in the Yosemite area. I do find their approximation nestled amongst these rocks to be of interest. This one, the fire got a little out of control, looks like. And these, uh, man, my grandmama used to have these little flowers in there. I don't know why I said my grandmama like that. <laughs> I certainly never called her that when she was alive. But these little flowers are, um... I remember those little flowers. That's all I'm saying. Uh, this is more of along the lines of what I would expect. This is cabins that uh, they built out in the Yosemite wilderness area. And they are long since, well, they've gone back to uh, the earth from which they came. As we all will one day. Lord have mercy. Well, yeah, this is a nice peek at some sanity when you're looking at architecture. You know, these things make sense. They're a bit comforting. Even though they're a little dumpy. And why is there a watermelon on the floor? And, um, maybe Gallagher lived here. This is, this is, this is the insight into Gallagher's uh, cabin here. Rest in peace. Sorry, Gallagher. Chimney, you've been a bad boy. You go outside. No. And poor Chimney had much to reflect on. This is an interesting little mantle made of roof shingles. It's kind of a cool idea. This is about how I would expect people to live. Strange combination of... Homes like this that look like they're of the earth, you know, made in accordance with the nature. And then those just ridiculous ones you see out there in L.A. Just, ooh, little old world sconce here. Spicing it up a little, are we? This must be the supervisor's cabinet with a secret bookshelf. That water looks nice. And uh, more bridges with more sketchy rubble. Hmm, that doesn't look very safe. Here we find ourselves at the Hovden Cannery. Old Cannery Row. Immortalized by John Steinbeck. This was one of the oldest and largest canneries of the Pacific Sardine Fisheries. One of the most lucrative national fisheries. And its founder, Mr. Hovden, was an innovator in canning technology here. The crumbling remains, this confusing batch of structures which have been enlarged and revised and modified and it seems rather difficult actually to find the original structures all been lengthened and heightened and the guy that owned this was a major force in changing the canning process from handcrafted to mechanized on this row alone 12 canneries 12 different canneries and two waste product plants but there was 39 of them in the Monterey area alone at the time of this survey most of these canneries have been vacated fan burned down, or demolished. This one is one of the few that are still standing. So the sardine fisheries that used to fish the, the waters of from, from British Columbia to Baja, California, and the sardine, since it's a, it's a free-roaming fish, they only can really tell the actual number of them from what they were catching. Uh, in 1916, interesting basement there, to 17, 27,000 tons of sardines. By the 30s, that number was more than 500,000 tons. And that level was sustained for a decade. So all of those fish basically supported this canning and byproducts industry that at the time was like in the tens of millions annual value. It, it was the largest single species fishing industry in the United States. So after World War One, they were canning them, they were turning them into fish oil and meal for agriculture, they were selling them overseas. But fish researchers were warning that adult sardines were disappearing and that a loss of those was going to, you know, deplete the population. Population. And canners and fishermen didn't care. The legislature and the California Fish and Game Commission, uh, they were, they're in charge of encouraging the growth of fishing and canning, and also in charge of protecting the fishery, and so they didn't do anything. So when all the adult sardines were eliminated and the catch diminished, uh, it was pretty much too late. And the Fish and Game Commission Committee, all they did was try to increase the productivity of the fisheries. After World War II, there was a decrease, and in a few years it became pretty obvious that the, that the fish were disappearing. Down to, it's 1968 when less than one 100 tons were caught in California waters. And then finally, legislature enacted a moratorium. They were so wasteful. They were taking full fish and reducing them to oil and meal. And the two world wars were heavy demands because the European canneries kind of stopped functioning. When the people charged with the conservation are also uh, in charge of the expansion and development, early California seemed to be just nothing but exploitation. Want and disregard of everything. Cut down thousands of redwood trees. Slaughter billions and billions of sardines uh, only to go bankrupt and have your building look like this. There's a sketchy story here about the Chinese establishing a fishing village in 1853 on the protected beach between Point Cabrillo where the Hopkins Marine Station is. The Chinese fishing community was prospering by 1880, second only to San Francisco in volume. This prosperity, ho, 
however, and the characteristics of the Chinese settlement soon led to friction, and the Chinese village, the entire village, this village that rivaled San Francisco, burned to the ground on May 16th, 1906. Hmm. Isn't that right around the time of the earthquake? Burned to the ground. And all of its inhabitants had to move. Interesting. Mr. Frankie Booth makes another appearance. Booth had had a cannery in Pittsburgh, California, where he experimented with canning sardines, which at the time were just used for, like, basically salmon bait. And Booth's cannery burned to the ground. Uh, some resentment from salmon fishermen when he switched to sardines, allegedly. He rebuilt the cannery at the same spot in 1903, the foot of the Monterey Commercial Pier. In 1905, he hired Newt Hovden and Pete Ferrante, who came to Monterey from the Pittsburgh plant. and completely revolutionized fishing, brought in different nets and a different method for unloading the fish. And Hovden leaves Booth, builds his own cannery. Then World War I happened, and severe decrease of European canning activity. And the U.S. government starts calling for high-protein foods, and canned fish suddenly takes off. They go from 97,000 cases in 1916 to 798,000 cases in 1919. Pretty insane. So then, it becomes this ridiculous history of buying and selling of canneries that becomes very difficult to trace. The Bayside Fish Company bought... Well, they are owned by the wealthy Chinese, aren't they? Well, they were bought by the Great Western Packing Company. Well, what year was that? Well, that was 1918. Wait, Western? Didn't they also own the Santa Cruz Packing Company? Well, that's true. That was purchased by Hawthorne in 1923. What about the Pacific Fish Company? Well, that was formerly the Monterey Fishing and Packing Company. It was purchased by the California Packing Company in 1925. And yada, yada, yada. And Mr. Hovden faced a setback in 1921 when his cannery, too, was burned to the ground. An investigation determined that the cause was arson. Entrance covered only part of it. Nevertheless, he rebuilt at the same site. And from then on, the canning industry grew without interruption for 25 years. There were setbacks in the industry, but they were corrected by measures taken by the federal and local government, and the prosperity continued. This is all encouraged by the government. There's a high ceiling price on sardines. The War Production Board set aside the entire 1942-43 to catch for government use, giving give the fisher, uh, the canneries a massive contract. Uh, military volunteers helped keep the canneries operating. And after World War II, finally, it all collapsed. They tried to do other fish like squid and mackerel and anchovy and salmon. But without the sardines, they didn't even declare bankruptcy. They just closed their doors and wandered off. So from 13 canneries and 17 reduction plants, 45, there's only 5 in 1957. By 62, this one was the only one remaining. It's brick walls telling us a different story. Then in 67, it was, uh, Mr. Hovden had retired to Mexico by now in 51. And interestingly enough, Stanford University comes in and acquires the property. Interesting. They shipped away all the uh, canning equipment to some other plants, and it stood empty ever since. So Stanford University owns this land, and they're just allowed just to let it just rot and do nothing with it. Ridiculous. So this is the row that Charles Steinbeck famously wrote about. These are the personalities and the men, and what a crazy story of exploitation California really is in every way. And I'll see you. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.